هاي بدنا يكعوا لها انا انا الى اولى امنا ليه يزويها لي 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 Aloha and welcome to Mauna Lei. Mauna Lei is the smallest ahupua'a of the 13 on Lanai, and we're here in the valley, which used to sustain at least 1,000 native Hawaiians, which is pretty incredible if you think about our current population of 3,000. Just in this valley alone, there were 1,000 Hawaiians living. Mauna Lei means mountain garland or a mountain lei, so um, we're in the middle of the valley, but if you look up and see the ridge line, you can imagine how the clouds kind of sit along the ridge like a lei um, encircling the mountain, the mountain ridge. And so that's how we can infer Mauna Lei can be interpreted. This place is very special because it's sustained so much life in traditional times. And today it looks much different than it used to. Um, so we'll be learning about some of the history of this place, how Hawaiians uh, took care of this land, and also learning about some of the mo'olalo that are relevant to this area. So Mauna Lei was a very uh, lush, abundant place for people to live, but there are no people living here today. So what happened? So while there were a thousand Hawaiians living here in traditional times, there was a severe population decline that occurred after Western contact. So across the islands, about 90% of the population unfortunately passed away. And like we discussed in other places, including Hii and Kahikavalo Kanepu'u, one of the major disruptions to our natural landscape were the introduction of ungulates such as goats, deer, and mouflon sheep, and particularly goats were a terrible um, introduction to Lanai in particular because they have the ability to climb along steep cliffs. And so while we're in Mauna Lea in the valley, walls are very steep, um, goats were able to actually traverse along those, ri those ridges. And what they caused were rock slides that actually would come down the valley and pose a big threat for pe people, people who were living here, but also their uh, agricultural plots and lo'ikalo, they would um, wreak havoc on those. And so Mauna Lei actually became a pretty dangerous place for people to continue living. And so um, a lot of people moved out of Mauna Lei Valley to Kiamoku. So while Mauna Lei has been uninhabited for many decades at this point and has been you know, very overrun with invasive species like we've seen on the other vahipana that we've visited so far, there are still restoration efforts that are underway to try to bring health back to Mauna Lei. And so one of those things is trying to restore some of the traditional lo'ikalo um, that would have been here in the valley. And so while it's slightly different than um, you know, how Hawaiians may have done it because Mauna Lei stream doesn't flow anymore, you know, we do have a, a pump pumping up water from Mauna Lei Spring, and we're allowed, we are able to irrigate our lo'ikalo that way. So you, you can see some lo'ikalo behind me, um, trying to bring back cultivating food back to this area. Okay, so if you wanted a window into the value systems of Hawaiians of old, um, all you needed to look at was how they treated their water. So the Hawaiian word for fresh water is vai, um, and they thought that it was so important and so valuable to them that the word for wealth is vai vai, right? Because if you have lots of water, then you are considered to be a wealthy person. Um, and so here in Mauna Lei, we see that that presence of vai as vital to um, how we were able to produce food here and essentially sustain ourselves. And that happened through lo'ikalo. And lo'ikalo are taro patches. Um, and what's amazing about this type of agriculture, uh, it's a true feat of Hawaiian innovation um, in that it's 
a system of a bunch of different loikalo, right? Because we're working here with the flow of water. Instead of diverting it out to different places or just damming it to keep it in a certain place, Hawaiians use water's natural ability to flow um, with the understanding that water comes before them and also goes after them. So they would take the water from the top of the valley, irrigate it through their systems, allow the nutrients to flow through their kalo or their loikalo, and then after, go back into the stream so that it feeds the shoreline, right? Because everything works in harmony together from the top to the bottom. And so lo'ikalo here are fed through these different away or streams. Usually there's a, a central source of water at the top called the po'ovai, and then they are able to flow through all of these different lo'ikalo, and then at the end, go back to the stream. So another reason why Mauna Lei was particularly special to us is that this was the only source of continually flowing fresh water here on Lanai. Um, and as you can see, Kalo needs continuous source of water um, and a lot of it in order to grow. Um, and so since it's a staple food of our diet as Hawaiians, um, then we, need, we know that we need water for it to, to grow also. And so Mauna Lei is an example for us to learn from of how past action affects our current realities um, because the water doesn't flow here as, as abundantly as it did in the past, right? And so things like the destruction of our watershed and then also diversion of water out for new industries like pineapple and ranching um, kind of depleted the resources of this, this valley um, to, from where it once was to what we have today. So in thinking about Mala Ma'aina and Aloha Aina caring for the land that we live on, uh, we would encourage all of you to think about when you go to places to make sure that you leave it better than how you found it. And so that's applicable to if you go to the beach picking up rubbish or you know pulling some weeds at your grandma's house. It's always a good idea to think about um, the impact that you're having on the places you go, even if it's just you know a short visit. And so, if we were all down here in Mauna Lei together, you know we would we would be learning from this place, but we would also want to leave it better than when we arrived. And so, something that we probably would have done would be to remove a lot of the, the weeds and invasive species that are here. Or you can see that Lo'i Kalo is um, kind of becoming a little stagnant because it's being built up by this algae that just grows naturally here but um, you know when it grows too much then the water isn't um, flowing properly and so something that we would have done if we were all together is to just clear out some of the away the channel so that water flow uh, works well and gets all the, the water to different kalo patches um, and so we hope that that's a lesson that you take with you wherever you go um, to always try to leave a positive legacy um, wherever you go. So we hope that Mauna Lei will be a place of education for people to learn about how Hawaiians sustainably lived here and how we might learn from some of their values and their practices because Hawaiians took care of the land as chief, as, someone, as something that was above humans and something that sustained us. Even in our modern day, we have you know, different technology, different lifestyles, but the value of taking care of the land and learning from it and cultivating it, those are all things that we can hope to aspire to learn from our Native Hawaiian ancestors here. And Mauna Lei still retains, you know, lots of kukui trees. There are things that have been resilient against lots of changes that have occurred across Lanai, and that's something worth protecting. Um, and so we hope that Mauna Lei is a place where, uh, you know, when Eikeho is back in session, that we can bring people and um, teach them about how we hope to live on Lanai in a good way. So in traditional Hawaiian culture and in Hawaiian times, private property ownership wasn't a, a concept for na Native Hawaiians. And so the idea of sectioning off land and owning that piece of land is a very foreign concept. And when Westerners came to the Hawaiian Islands, that's an idea that they brought with them, um, privatizing sections of land for profit or whatever um, they wanted. So in 1848, there was a very important um, thing that occurred, which was the Mahele. And the Mahele effectively um, allowed private property ownership in Hawaii, which was uh, very different because for Hawaiians, you, you cultivate and you care for aina as it cares for you, and that happens over generations without any kind of paper saying that 
you know, you own the rights to this land. The Hawaiians were told that they needed to apply for a plot of land that uh, their, even if their family had been cultivating that area for generations, they were now told that they had to put in an application to be able to retain rights to that property. And so while some Hawaiians did this, if we think back to 1848 and maybe even to Native Hawaiians living in this valley, one, communication was very, it was a lot slower back then, and so if you can imagine, you know, this proclamation coming out out of Oahu, for example, the time it would take to get all the way to Lanai and then into Mauna Lea Valley would probably have been quite a while. And even if people did find out about it, it could have been an active choice for them to choose not to do so because, you know, if they've been here for centuries, if their families have been here for centuries, then we can imagine that one might look at the paper saying, oh, you need to apply to stay here as kind of, um, you know, ridiculous because it's, you know, when you think about Hawaiians who have spent their lives here and raised their children and their ancestors are from here, um, it seems a little strange to be told that now you need to put in an application to be able to stay on your aina. And so um, there were some Native applicants who did uh, apply to stay in Mauna Lea and there those properties were called kuleana parcels and um, unfortunately when goats were introduced and they created a dangerous environment for people to continue living here then um, some people traded their kuleana parcels in Mauna Lea for parcels that were at Kimoku. So um, if you ever heard of Kimoku village which will be um, going near that area when we go to Waiopai, um, that's where a lot of Native Hawaiians uh, who were still living on Lanai in the early 1900s, where they made their homes.